All right, did anyone eat the Impossible Burger? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, Pat Brown, while we were uh, whining and dining, was jogging here a mile and a half. Um, <laughs> sorry. Ca caught in traffic, it was faster to run. <laughs> <laughs> and more sustainable. So um, the Impossible Burger has been called, I took some notes, um, they have been called fake burgers, vegan burger that bleeds, plant meat. Mm -hmm. um, what do you, how do you think of your product? Um, well, we think of it as uh, meat ba made a better way. So um, the meat today um, basically is made using a prehistoric technology, which is uh, using animals to turn plant into this very um, special category of food that's defined by um, a, a particular kind of delicious flavor and sensory experience and a nutritional profile and uh, in general um, affordability and accessibility. Um, and we actually have done um, some research and to a typical consumer like your hardcore American burger lover, the value proposition of meat has nothing to do with it's coming from an animal. Any more than the value proposition of transportation 200 years ago had anything to do with uh, it's being a horse. Um, and so um, when you frame it that way, basically um, we have just approached the problem of creating the meats and other um, uh, foods that are currently derived using animals as the, the production technology um, using a much more sustainable, versatile, um, improvable approach. And as a consequence, um, you know, our products, like our meats, unlike the cow, which stopped improving, um, you know, first of all, it's not even trying to be delicious, and, um, <laughs> and it stopped really improving at that, uh, you know, a million years ago. And, uh, and this is a really critical difference, is that because we um, are able to deliberately optimize deliciousness, sustainability, nutrition, affordability, we're getting better all the time and we'll keep getting better. And um, so I think of it as basically uh, the meat that the world loves, that meat lovers love, uh, but made a much better way across the board. It's really precise. It's not tweetable. Is there? What do you call the burger in a tweet? Shortest, shortest description of it. I, you know, I am the world's least tweetable person. Okay, so, um, you might as well just give up hope on that. Um, I mean, you could just say it's meat made a better way. How about that? Does that fit? Yeah. Okay, we'll yeah. go with that. It's interesting. Um, you're, do you think you're courting controversy by calling it meat? We saw a lot of controversy around uh, Just Mayo from Hampton Creek, another food science company. Yeah, it's not about it's not about the word or the, the name. I, I think it's about it's about the concept. So of course there are as it happens, meat turns out is not a regulated word. So you could call anything meat. I could call that chair meat. Um, <laughs> there's no there's no law that prevents me from doing that. But um, uh, as opposed to beef, I couldn't call anything beef. That's a, is a regulated word. But it's not about the word. Okay, it's about it's about the concept. It's about what it is to the consumer. Okay, um, and um, you know, with respect to regulation, yes, I expect that uh, when we uh, become viewed as a real material, a consumer clearly delivers what they love about meat. You know, we can call it whatever we want. It's not about the name. Uh, I was first aware of the company. I guess were you founded five years ago now? Uh, five, or six? five and a half or so. Okay, yeah. and the product just. Uh, became available in restaurants this year? Yeah, so so I founded the company about five and a half years ago, but basically we were in like deep stealth for um, three years. I don't think anyone outside of the company really knew we existed. Um, by the time anyone did, we had like 80 scientists working on the, the problem. Um, and, um, and then it was another year. And basically what they were doing was uh, initially not trying to develop a product, but basically it was kind of like the problem, think of it like, say you're a biotech company and you're trying to um, develop a cure for, um, you know, diabetes or cancer or something like that. 
Um, you know, if you're smart, you don't start by just taking wild swings at the problem. You start by um, doing a really, really deep systematic study of, for example, in that case, sort of the normal physiology at a molecular level of, of cells and tissues and so forth, and then how it gets um, disrupted by whatever disease you're trying to treat. And then, but you start by doing, you don't just start right away, I'm going to make a product. You start by saying, I'm going to really understand the problem so we can make deliberate choices. So that's what we did for two and a half or three years. And then, um, and then we started taking what we'd learned and, and trying to work on our first product, which strate for strategic reasons I think are self-evident, is raw ground beef. Um, and, um, and optimize and optimize and optimize. And that process is continuing and we're literally doing about 100 rounds a month of um, producing a bunch of variants where we vary some uh, characteristic and then we do a lot of uh, sensory testing, pick the winners, repeat, repeat, repeat. And then when I say that, the cow's not getting any better and we are. I mean, you, can, you could take the burger that we made last month and compare it to the one we made this month. And most consumers, when we tested, and we tested you know, with a, um, a lot of consumer testing, will find it better. And the same will be true next month and the following month. Um, but we first went in the market like, um, Oh, I think it was last summer, uh, we, we um, started, um, or David Chang, who's a, uh, the most followed chef on Instagram, which is a, a you know, high honor, I think, and he's a very, very uh, outspoken and, and well-regarded chef. He just encountered through a chain of events our burger and immediately wanted to put it in his restaurant. And this is a guy, one of my colleagues at Stanford, um, uh, you know, for whom bacon is like an entire food group. Uh, he's just like the meatiest guy on earth. He, he, he told me, Dave Chang is my god. Okay, so this is a guy who's like, you know, really hardcore, um, beloved by meat lovers. But he really loved our product and he wanted it put in his restaurant. Um, and so we went for it. And um, because obviously the most, biggest challenge for us is the only people we care about as customers are meat lovers. Like, our mission is to completely replace animals as a food production technology, not by, you know, violence, but by victory in the marketplace. And, um, and that means that we have to convince people who are uncompromising meat lovers, who are the only people we care about, um, that our product is good enough for them to eat. And if Dave Chang, whose entire reputation depends on making his meat-loving customers happy, says this is good enough to serve to his customers, it's a strong message to um, our target consumers. I heard you actively avoiding saying, state his reputation there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to wonder, why not clean meat, which is this sort of synthetic biology approach, um, using the actual animal cells to make a you know, supposedly exact uh, equivalent. Why, why not pursue the clean meat? Um, well, basically, the, the simple answer is because that is one of the stupidest ideas um, ever expressed. And, and the way, um, it, it's, it's, first of all, it's not true that you can do a better job that way because you then buy into, at best, the same limitations that a cow has, okay? And um, and I'll just give you kind of like a, a thought experiment to understand how, from an economic standpoint, this is just completely unscalable. Actually, I'll give you two things. First of all, if we could grow tissues that were a meaningful replica of animal tissues at an affordable price uh, from stem cells, it would revolutionize, you know, medicine. Look around. It's not happening. Um, and and, and when it does happen, it'll be extremely expensive, irreducibly expensive. Okay, 10 minutes. So this is, I, this is I'm the least tweetable guy, and I mean it. So, okay, <laughs> let me answer this quick, quickly. Um, think of this thought experiment. Suppose I were to say, okay, here's the way we're going to make beef from now on. We are going to take um, fetal calves and um, wipe out their immune system and then feed them intravenously for their entire lives 
until they're ready to be turned into meat, okay? You'd probably say, well, that's a really stupid idea. And uh, it would be easier than growing them from stem cells in vitro, okay? So it's a terrible idea. That's why we're not doing it. <laughs> Do you think, um, and, and venture investors have backed some of those companies, so I'm wondering, well, your view uh, on VCs in food, do they know what they're doing? Um, <laughs> it's not VCs in food, actually. I mean, I would say, this is one thing that really struck me, is that, is that it's astonishing, um, and you know, I love, I love VCs, and I particularly love the ones that have invested in us, and you know, bless their hearts. Um, <laughs> But um, astonishing how little diligence they do into the actual science of, uh, that underlies um, some technology company. It's astonishing because, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm talking to these guys and I'm saying, ask me a hard scientific question, you know, dig, 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 you know. Um, and uh, it doesn't happen. And, and you know, there's... there's um, Sometimes some of the venture firms that we work with will ask me to take a look at a company and I'll say, you know, whatever I'll say about it, but it doesn't really matter what I say, but sometimes I'll say, you know, if I were you, I would just flush my money down the toilet because it's faster and easier. Um, it doesn't matter. They're, they're, the, the amount of scientific diligence, my experience, and I don't mean you guys, maybe you guys are, are completely different, um, <laughs> it's very rare that they do really serious scientific diligence by my standards, the way one of my colleagues at Stanford would do it if they were looking at a science-based technology. Do you think it would help for the firms to have scientists in-house? It's not, you know, yes, I think it certainly would. And not only that, but to listen to them. And, um, and to really, um, and to really look critically at it. And sometimes it's just like, just do the math. Um, but, um, but anyway, I'm glad, I, seriously, I'm not being ironic here, I'm really glad that, I think it's one of the great things about the venture world is that, is that people will make wild, risky bets on things that they see as highly risky, like a science-based project that they haven't done diligence on, but have, have the potential for a huge payoff, and we would have never gotten any money if that wasn't true. So I think there's, there's a very good thing about it, and obviously it must work pretty well or you guys wouldn't be here. Tell us a little bit about your funding status now. Um, how much have you raised from these outside investors? Do you supplement that with grants and non dilutive sources? And who are your investors? I know some of them, but... Um, how much have we raised? What am I allowed to say about that? <laughs> Consult Crunchbase for that. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's just say it's more than $200 million. Um, and um, we have amazingly great investors. We don't let anyone invest in the company. We, we're very selective about who they are, and they have to be people who understand that uh, this is not something that they're going to, um, if, they want, if they're looking for a quick exit, look elsewhere. Um, and uh, we have told them we are not going to be acquired. Forget about that. And um, if we go public, it'll only be because it's, we need the money that way. You know, we need, we need more access to more capital, which is probably going to happen um, someday. But um, so the investors that we get are people who, they're serious financial investors. The market we're going after is a $1.5 trillion global market that is based entirely on a prehistoric technology that hasn't improved materially in a million years. And um, so that's like a no-brainer in a certain sense from a financial standpoint. But, um, but we're looking for people who see the financial potential gain, but really believe in our mission and are not looking for a quick, quick exit. So our people we have, uh, our first investors were Coastal Ventures, uh, who have been great investors um, from the get-go and reinvested in every round. Uh, Bill Gates, one of his investor, venture funds. Um, Horizons, Google Ventures, Viking Ventures, uh, um, Tomasic, uh, UBS, um, a bunch of other uh, smaller investors. Um, but they're all really mission aligned and, and they've been great, extremely supportive. I could and I would ask you a bunch more questions, but I am certain the audience has many, so we have about five minutes. 
Um, Okay. Thank you. Uh, your marketing is interesting. I'm curious who's like the brain behind your marketing and kind of feels like, sorry, like a consumer website. And I was also curious about your distribution plans. Like when can someone like me start eating impossible meat foods? Uh. Uh, I don't have a microphone, but I'll just chat. Oh. <laughs> um, you, you, okay. First of all, uh, the marketing. We, um, it's hard to. It's there's lots of brains behind our marketing, um, and that's been the case. Actually, you know, one thing about our company is it's incredibly, I would say, collaborative and kind of non-hierarchical and so forth. So, I mean, really, I, I'm kind of hard put to think of. You cannot name someone who's behind our marketing. It's a great team. Um, we made a deliberate, uh, so in the US, um, there is more than five billion pounds of ground beef sold every year just in restaurants. Okay, that's a lot. And uh, when we have launched our first production plant uh, a little bit later this year in Oakland, it'll be producing about 10 million pounds a month. So it's, it's we barely, you know, barely touched this humongous market, even with what we think is, wow, that's a pretty big, you know, production plan. Um, and because in restaurants, um, we felt like this was the right way to introduce it. First of all, if you have some of the world's greatest chefs, like Michelin star chefs, who want to have your product on their menu, and they're meat guys, um, and you're only producing, as we are right now, like a few thousand pounds a month, you know, from a brand building standpoint, that's a no-brainer. You want, you want that. As we grow, we're still going to be in restaurants initially, primarily, for a variety of reasons, including the fact that we want when our, when our customers first experience our product to have it be more of an experience than if they just, you know, uh, pick something out of the freezer in their grocery store and, you know, whip something up or something like that. And the restaurant's a better way of doing it. Um, if you want something in 10 minutes, I think, what's the closest place? Chris Probably Cosentino? Public House. Oh, Public House. House. Okay, yeah, walk to Public House. Yeah, yeah. Last I heard, um, uh, our, our the Impossible Burger is selling even with the burger made from a cow at Public House um, to hardcore Giants fans. So figure that one out. What's the threshold for like nutritional value versus uh, taste profile? I don't know if you answered that. What's the threshold between nutritional value and, and taste profile? How do you balance which is more important as you design the meat? Okay, um, that's a great question. Um, so the way that we thought about it is, first of all, number one, we have like a, a sort of a threshold guideline, which is. We will never put anything on, anything on the market that we don't believe, based on all the science that we can draw on, is healthier than what it replaces. So from a nutritional standpoint, that's table stakes, you might say. And then, excuse the expression, sorry. <laughs> it's hard to avoid this kind of stupid pun. Um, and, um, but um, we don't accomplish anything from a health or environmental or any kind of standpoint if no one buys our product. So. We're, so we have to make a product that sells itself primarily on deliciousness, but is, um, uh, it, but the, where the consumer is as well or better off in terms of nutrition. That's kind of the way we approach it. And we're constantly trying to improve the nutrition and the flavor and so forth. But, but again, if we wanted to make something that, you know, if you were willing to eat it, which you probably wouldn't be, is, you know, sort of the healthiest thing you could eat, um, we wouldn't accomplish our bigger mission, mission, which is to replace animals with food production technology. I guess one other thing I'll say about, about healthy eating is that people tend to, when you're looking at a particular food that's part of a diet, like hopefully no one is, is subsisting entirely on our product, the one thing that you know, uh, is the most important piece of nutritional advice you could possibly give anyone is eat a varied diet, okay? If, if, if you're relying on any one food for all your nutrition, well, we'll do our best to make it good for you, but it's a really stupid way of planning your diet. So I got to ditch the all M and M's diet. <laughs> were there, there are a couple more questions. So. Uh, just, just piggybacking on what you just said, how do you feel about Soylent? How, how, how do you feel about Soylent? <laughs> so um, when I was uh, in medical school and I was a pediatrician for three years, um, Ensure was. Um, 
kind of uh, something that would get me through long nights on call and so forth. And it was vile, actually. Um, but from a nutritional standpoint, it was very, like conceptually, it was very similar to Soylent. First of all, I, I, I really respect the people who are doing Soylent and so forth, and I, and, and I think that, you know, uh, they're trying to do something really important. Well, I think the one thing I would say, though, is the, the concept that there is a single food that you should rely on for all your nutrition is really a terrible concept, okay? And no discredit to them. I mean, they, they, but, but that's just a really bad idea across the board. If we're not, the truth is, the entire world, the medical profession, uh, uh, knows very little about, really, about optimal nutrition for humans. You cannot do long-term experiments, nutritional experiments on humans. Cannot be done. Best you can do is retrospective case control studies in large populations. And, and to give you kind of a thought experiment, if I did, uh, uh, looked at retrospective case control data and said, um, what's the health effect of mustard? You know, you'd probably conclude, wow, mustard is really dangerous for you. But yeah, because you put it on hot dogs. You know, um, in other words, it's very difficult. It's intrinsically like some of the weakest science um, uh, out there. So, so betting your uh, health on the state of the art of our knowledge of, of nutrition and human health, I think is kind of a bad idea. But, but on the other hand, having Soylent, you know, listen, listen, the people who are buying Soylent are people who used to live on a diet comprised entirely of Pepsi-Cola and Doritos, okay? <laughs> I.e. software engineers and, you know, people like that. So for them, it, there's no question this is an improvement. <laughs> this is very optimistic. Yeah. Okay, really good question. Uh, we've done a lot of consumer research to try to understand where we've, you know, given hundreds of consumers our product and, and asked them would they buy it instead of a burger, and if so, what, what's driving them, and so forth. One simple thing I'll say is if we give them our product and we just simply tell them it's made from plants, and, and we say, at parity price, would you buy this or what you've been buying? Two to one, they'll prefer our burger. If you tell them the, that it's got no cholesterol, no antibiotics, no hormones, less water use, less land use, less greenhouse gases, it's five to one. So when you learn from that kind of experiment, and I don't take those numbers literally, because it's just, it's, they're just a surrogate for kind of like what's going on in someone's head, but what I'd say is that um, the environmental benefits don't, don't trump deliciousness or affordability but they move the needle. And the health benefits don't trump deliciousness or affordability, but they also move the needle. And we are pushing on both of those, as well as deliciousness, as well as affordability. Um, our target customer, by definition, given our mission, is someone who would otherwise be buying something produced using an animal. That's our target customer. We, we, I, I'm, I've been vegan for a long time, but, but we don't give a shit about vegans. Okay? The only customer we're, we're producing food for is a hardcore meat eater. If a vegan buys our product, it's, it's a negative for our mission because it's just basically wasting that product that could otherwise be, you know, stealing a place on a meat eater's plate, um, you know, uh, on, on a vegan who can, you know, subsist on lentils and rice. <laughs> I'm afraid our time is up, but thank you very much.